Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the structure and function of the ear. There are three major areas of the ear, the external ear, the middle ear, and the internal ear. Keep in mind that these are areas and not specific structures. So external ear is everything here, basically everything outside of the eardrum. The middle ear is going to be this cavity over here. You're going to see three little ossicles, three little bones here. This is the middle ear area. And then we also have the internal ear, which contains this complicated and small organ called the labyrinth. Okay, same thing right here. You can see the external ear. See if I could color it. So everything out here is considered the outer ear. Here in this area, you have the middle ear, sort of like a cavity here. And we also have the inner ear area where you find this organ here called the labyrinth. So outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. Let's start with the external ear. Some of the structures of the external ear, we have the auricle, basically the ear, this is what we see on the outside. The external auditory canal, um, there, you could also call it the external acoustic meatus or external auditory meatus. All of those terms are correct. You also have the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, and the cerumen glands. These are the glands that produce that waxy substance in your ears. So first, let's start with the auricle. The auricle actually has two parts. There's the helix, and that's the cartilaginous part of your ear, and the lobule, which is the fleshy, dangling part of the ear. We could see it right here. So all of this, this whole outer ear portion, um, this is called the auricle. And this top part here, this is the helix, and this bottom portion, that's hanging, this is called the lobule. And here we have the canal right here, the external acoustic meatus. Next structure is the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. The tympanic membrane actually creates the boundary between the external ear and the middle ear. Um, it looks like a flattened cone, and the sound waves that come into your ear makes the eardrum vibrate. And the eardrum basically um, transfers this vibration to the, in, to the middle ear by the ossicles. So let's take a look at that. This is an actual picture of an eardrum. So here's the auricle over here. It's shaped the way that it is because it helps collect sound waves. So when sound waves are basically collected, they move into this external auditory canal or meatus or acoustic meatus. They travel this way. They're going to hit the tympanic membrane right here, causing the tympanic membrane to vibrate. And this vibration is going to be carried to the middle ear. The external acoustic meatus is a short curved tube that extends from the auricle to the eardrum. The entire canal is lined with skin-bearing hairs 
There's going to be sebaceous glands there and modified sweat glands called the ceruminous glands. These are the glands that are basically going to produce the waxy yellow substance in your ear um, to repel instinct, insects and um, trap foreign bodies. Okay, again, it's right here. It's really important to remember these structures for your lab practical. Next, we have the middle ear. So this is going to be a small air-filled cavity in the temporal bone. These are basically right here. I'm not going to ask you to identify the bones on an actual picture, on a real picture. I might use a model. But these are the, the three ossicles, the little bones called malleus, incus, and stapes. So they basically um, receive vibration from the eardrum and carry it to the inner ear area. Okay, let's look at it on a picture. Right here, you have the middle ear area behind the tympanic membrane. Should also include this tube here. Um, these are called the ossicles. These are three little bones that work as a lever system. And this is um, the auditory tube, formerly known as the eustachian tube. So this is an older name here. Okay, I want to make sure we could also identify this on a model. Um, so this area over here is the middle ear area, and these are going to be the three little bones. We'll take a closer look at them. And this right here, this is the auditory tube or the eustachian tube. Another name is the pharyngotympanic tube. In the middle ear, we're going to find the ossicles. These are the three little bones. Really important to remember these. They're called the malleus, incus, and stapes. This is an order from the tympanic membrane. So tympanic membrane is going to touch the malleus. Incus is going to be the middle bone. And stapes is actually the last one. And this is the one that's going to touch the labyrinth, so that organ in the inner ear area. The purpose of the ossicles is to work as a lever system to transmit vibration that's coming from the eardrum to the inner ear where basically action potentials could happen so that we could hear. In the middle ear area, you also have the auditory tube, formerly known as the eustachian tube. And the purpose of this tube is stabilizing pressure in the middle ear. And I'll talk about it more in just a second. So here are the ossicles. As you can see, they look very tiny. Um, right here, this is the actual size, but we actually have a model that's much bigger. Um, you should be able to identify these bones. This is malleus, incus, stapes, right here. Um, again, their purpose is to work as a lever system to transmit sound waves into the inner ear. So basically transmitting sound waves, that's their function. Okay, we can see it right here. Here's a tympanic membrane. This is going to vibrate, causing these three little bones to vibrate. And that vibration is going to be carried to the inner ear area right here. Okay, again, I'm not going to ask you to identify the on a picture like this, like a real image, but I do want you guys to know what they are on the actual model. This one right here is the malleus, this is the incus, this one right here is the stapes. The pharyngotympanic or auditory tube, again another name is the eustachian tube, um, is a tube that round runs down obliquely from the middle ear to the nasopharynx area. So right here, it's highlighted in green. This is going to be the auditory tube. 
please don't mix that up with this tube over here. This is the external auditory canal or external acoustic canal. This is going to be the auditory tube. So remember, tube and canal. They're two different structures. Um, the auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube is part of the middle ear. So let's look at the function. Normally, this tube is going to be flattened and closed. However, things like yawning or swallowing can briefly open it to stabilize pressure, pressure in the middle ear cavity. And this is important. Let's look at another slide. This is important because if the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane is not equal, here's the tympanic membrane, um, that will affect how this tympanic membrane vibrates. Therefore, it is going to distort hearing. It's going to affect the way that you're hearing sound waves. So it's important that we have the same amount of pressure here on your outer ear area versus your inner ear area. Um, if you've ever been on an airplane, when you reach high altitude, you'll notice that your ears are kind of hurting and you're having a hard time hearing. So you start basically chewing a gum or eating some peanuts and then your ears will pop. Well, that popping sound is this pharyngotympanic or auditory, auditory tube opening to relieve pressure in here so that both sides of the tympanic membrane have the same pressure. Now let's get to the inner ear area, and this is where things are going to get complicated. We're going to talk about some physiology. So first, I want to talk about the anatomy. The inner ear, so if you, if you look at the inner ear, you're going to find this organ over here. This is called the labyrinth. And they call it a labyrinth because it has such a complicated shape. Um, it's going to be found deep in the temporal bone, and it is a site of delicate receptor machinery. And it's important to remember that this inner ear organ, this labyrinth, isn't only for hearing, it's also for balance. So part of this labyrinth is for hearing, interpretation of sound, basically, and part of it is to help with balance, static balance or kinetic balance. Um, it monitors the rotation of your head, the movement of your head in space. So first, let's talk about two layers of the labyrinth. If we take out the labyrinth, it looks something like this over here. There are two layers to it. There is a bony labyrinth, and also a membranous labyrinth. So here's bony labyrinth right here. This is going to be this white layer that you see here. This white layer covering this whole labyrinth is called the bony labyrinth. And if we peel off this layer, we'll see that there's this gray layer right here. If you guys pay attention to this, you'll see that there's a gray layer underneath it. So the gray layer is basically called the membranous labyrinth. So this is like having a container inside another container. So we could think about it this way. There is one container in another container, and that's what it's like. Now the bony labyrinth is going to contain a fluid called the perilymph. Important to remember. And the membranous labyrinth contains a fluid called the endolymph. The perilymph is actually similar to your cerebrospinal fluid and um, the endolymph inside the membranous labyrinth is similar to intracellular fluid. So think about it this way. You have a container, you pour a little bit of water in it, and then you also put another container in it, and then you pour more water in that container. So that's kind of what it's like. So you have this bony labyrinth here, this white layer, this pink area that you see. 
This is supposed to represent the space that contains perilymph. And then here we have the membranous labyrinth. And inside the membranous labyrinth, you're going to find endolymph. Here's a picture I found um, on the internet. It might help you a little bit. So the blue, the dark blue here, is supposed to represent the bony labyrinth. And the pink or light purple here is supposed to represent the membranous labyrinth. So you have one layer inside of another layer, and each layer is going to contain some fluids in there. Okay, again, bony labyrinth. This is a model we common use, commonly use in lab. Bony labyrinth right here, the white layer. Um, the pink layer. Right here, you can see this pink layer. This is supposed to represent perilymph inside the bony labyrinth. And you could also see this gray area over here, all of this gray area. This is the membranous labyrinth. And inside of that, you're going to have the endolymph. Okay, here's another picture. You could see bony labyrinth here, membranous labyrinth, the gray, and here's a little bit of space in between them. It's going to be filled with fluid. So those were the layers of the labyrinth. Now let's talk about structures. We could divide the labyrinth into three main parts. The vestibule, this is going to be like a middle portion, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. This right here, this area right here that basically looks like a snail, this is the cochlea. And by the way, this part of the labyrinth is going to be involved with hearing. This middle portion, this is the vestibule. This part is actually involved with static balance. So things like acceleration. And these structures over here, these are called the semicircular canals. So very important to remember these three structures. This is the cochlea, the vestibule, and these are the semicircular canals. Okay, let's look at the next slide. I want you to be able to identify these on the model. Right here, this is the cochlea. So here's the cochlea right here. Again, this is the part that's going to be involved with hearing. This area over here. This is the vestibule, and these right here are the semicircular canals. And as you can see, there's three of them. Um, they basically respond to the X, Y, Z coordinates, and I'll talk about it more in a second. If you pay attention here, you'll see that when the tympanic membrane vibrates, it's going to Here's the tympanic membrane. It's going to carry sound waves into the middle ear and they're going to be transferred, so to speak, by the ossicles. Here's the stay piece. As you can see, it's going to touch the labyrinth right here. So basically the vibration is going to come into this inner ear area. This is the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, you learned about this in AMP1, and there's going to be two branches to it. When it comes to this inner ear area, it's going to branch. So there's going to be a vestibular branch right here, which goes to the vestibule, and it's, it was cut on this model, and this is the cochlear branch right here. Let's talk about the cochlea. 
So from the Latin, it means snail, and it does look like, like a snail. It's going to be very small. It's the size of a split pea. The cochlea is going to house the receptor organ for hearing called the spiral organ or organ of corti. Very important to remember. Basically, the organ, the receptor organ for hearing is called the organ of corti. Sometimes I call it spiral organ of corti, but that's not really correct. Um, I like to use organ of corti. So the cochlea is going to contain an outer bony labyrinth and an inner membranous labyrinth. The bony labyrinth and membranous labyrinth together form three ducts in the cochlea. The scala vestibuli, scala uh, media, and scala tympani. Also called vestibular duct, cochlear duct, and tympanic duct. The terms that we usually use in lab, I use scala vestibuli, I don't typically use scala media, I use cochlear duct and scala tympani. It's important to remember these three ducts that are formed in the cochlea. What I'm going to do is show you what this cochlea looks like if we cut it open. So as you could see, this model here, it could be open and we could see what the cochlea looks like on the inside. So this is what it looks like on the inside. This is the cochlea, we cut it open, and the three ducts that I talked about, right here, let's look at this right here. Here you could see the three ducts, here you could see the three ducts, here, here, and here. So the pink is supposed to represent scala vestibuli, the blue is supposed to represent scala media or the cochlear duct. And the green is supposed to represent scala tympani. These are the three ducts that I was talking about. Um, now, we're going to use a much larger model to talk about these ducts. Here's the cochlea. So basically, these are the three ducts. We basically took what was on the previous slide, right here, and blew it up. So it looks like this. Up here, let's label this really quickly. This area right here, this duct over here, this is the scala vestibuli. And the scala vestibuli is basically going to be filled with perilymph. This is the scala media right here, this duct over here. Another name for it is going to be um, scala media or cochlear duct right here. And this is going to contain endolymph. And down here we have scala tympani, which is going to be filled with perilymph. So these are the three ducts that we need to remember. This is a picture on an actual microscope slide. I'm not going to ask you to identify them on a microscope slide, but I do want you to know how to identify the structures on a model. This is just for your information. Okay, let's go over each one. Scala vestibuli, duct that is continuous with the oval window. Important to pay attention to that. The oval window. This duct is part of the bony labyrinth and contains perilymph. Remember that here's the bony labyrinth out here. And we talked about right below the bony labyrinth, you have perilymph. So it makes sense. 
This duct over here, scala vestibuli, this is continuous with the oval window. This means that when vibrations come into the inner ear area, they're first gonna going to enter the scala vestibuli. So this is the first point of contact in the inner ear um, with vibrations of sound. A good way, by the way, to remember the scala vestibuli is to pay attention to where you have the vestibular membrane. This right here, this diagonal line that you see, diagonal membrane, this is the vestibular membrane. So above that, you always have the scala vestibuli. Next, you have scala media or the cochlear duct. That's going to be right here. Um, it is part of the membranous labyrinth. So we talked about membranous labyrinth containing endolymph. So again, it's because it's part of the membranous labyrinth, it is going to contain endolymph right here. And this is very important because this organ right here, this part that, of the duct that you see right here, this is going to be most directly involved with hearing. Next, you have scala tympani right down here. This is going to be part of the bony labyrinth. Again, this right here is the bony labyrinth. So scala tympani is a duct that is part of the bony labyrinth. And as you remember, the bony labyrinth contains, in, um, excuse me, contains perilymph. This was a typo right here. I need to fix that, but it does contain perilymph. So perilymph here, scala vestibuli, perilymph, scala tympani, and endolymph is going to be in the cochlear duct. Okay, the organ of corti located in the cochlear duct and contains receptor cells for hearing. What is the organ of corti? This is the organ that's directly involved with hearing. Here's all of this, by the way. Students always get confused. This whole duct right here, this is called the cochlear duct or the scala media. Now this organ here, just this part of it, this is called the organ of corti. So again, this is the scala media or cochlear duct, and just this part over here is called the organ of corti. Now we need to talk about the organ of corti in detail because this is involved with hearing. This is what allows hearing to happen. The organ of corti is going to rest on the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane plays a very important role in hearing. Here's the basilar membrane right here. This blue part over here. And the organ of corti also has these receptor cells called hair cells. It looks like they have hair on top. That's why they're called hair cells. So right here, these cells over here, these are called the hair cells. And the ones that are going to be on the inside, these are called inner hair cells. The ones towards the outside are called outer hair cells. You also have afferent fibers of the vestibulocochlear nerve. This is supposed to be nerve, another typo here. Coil the base of hair cells and run from the organ of corti to the brain. So you're going to have fibers of the vestibulocochlear nerve coming here. And they're going to come up all the way here. So what's going to happen, we talked about fluids being in here. When vibration comes into this part of the inner ear, 
the fluids are going to shake. And when they shake, they basically shake the bacillar membrane. So the bacillar membrane kind of vibrates and um, activates these hair cells. These hair cells are going to move, and when they move, these hair-like extensions over here rub against the tectoral membrane over here. This is called the tectoral membrane. And when these hair cells rub against the tectoral membrane, action potentials are going to be generated, which are going to be carried through the vestibulocochlear nerve. So here you're going to have action potentials happening, and they're going to be transmitted through the vestibulocochlear nerve and go to brain, basically, for hearing. Here's a closer look right here. Um, here's the bacillar membrane, an important structure to remember. This is the tectoral membrane right here. Here are the hair cells over here. You can see on top they do have these little fibers on top that look like hair cells. They're not really hair. So again, when this vibration enters the inner ear area, the fluids are going to move. They're, it's kind of like a gel shaking. It's going to move the bacillar membrane. When this bacillar membrane move, moves, it's going to activate the hair cells that are sitting on top of it. So these hair cells over here, they're going to move, they're going to vibrate and rub against this tectoral membrane, generating action potentials that are going to be carried into these nerve fibers over here, nerve fibers of the vestibular cochlear nerve, cochlear nerve to be specific, and they're going to be transmitted to the brain for hearing to happen. Helicotrema, this is the part of the bony labyrinth where the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani meet. Therefore, the ducts are continuous by the helicotrema. So if we look at the model here, here's the cochlea right here, and the helicotrema is going to be on the center portion. So the helicotrema is going to be right here. And this is actually an area where the scala tympani and the um, scala vestibuli meet. So the two outer ducts meet in that area. And it's important to keep this in mind, and you'll see why in just a second. So if we take this cochlea right here and stretch it out, stretch it out so it's a straight line, it would look something like this over here. Here's the scale of vestibuli, scala tympani, and in between you have the cochlear duct. Um, you'll see why in just a second, but it's really important to remember, remember this structure. Here's the outer ear. So this is your ear collecting sound waves. Coming in here, this is the external auditory canal. Hitting the eardrum. Sound waves are going to hit the eardrum. They're going to vibrate the ossicles right here. The ossicles are going to transmit the vibration here to the scala vestibuli. Um, here's the stapes over here. And the area where stapes is going to touch the labyrinth, this is called the oval window. So it's going to touch it right here, and the vibration is going to be carried here to the scala vestibuli first. This is another picture. It's not perfect, but I found it on the internet. I thought it was interesting. Here's the eardrum. Here are the ossicles right here. And uh, basically transmitting sound wave into the scale of vestibuli right here. And as you can see here, here's the helicotrema. Let's go back to the previous slide. You can see right here, through the helicotrema, there's this duct here. When we stretch, stretch out the cochlea, that connects, connects the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani.
Now, one step at a time, um, we're going to talk about how hearing happens, transmission of sound to the inner ear. So first, tympanic, um, the sound waves are going to enter the external acoustic meatus and cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. So sound waves right here are going to enter this canal over here, the external acoustic canal or meatus, and they're going to hit the eardrum, causing this eardrum to vibrate. Next, as this eardrum vibrates, this vibration is going to move to the ossicles right here. The ossicles are going to vibrate and they're going to carry this vibration right here to the oval window. This is the oval window. Remember, this is where the stay piece is going to touch the labyrinth. So the sound waves are carried from the eardrum through the, to the inner ear by the ossicles. As Stapes rocks back and forth against the oval window, it, sends, it sets the perilymph in the scala vestibula into motion. So right here, we're going to have sound waves coming in, hitting the tympanic membrane, then the ossicle, then it's going to come here to the inner ear area. This is the cochlea stretched out. So what's going to happen is that the first duct that it comes into contact with, with is the scale of vestibuli. And the perilymph here in the scale of vestibuli is basically going to shake. It's going to shake this fluid in here. One of two things are going to happen. If the frequency is low, the frequency of sound coming into your ear is low, the waves will move from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympani by the helicotrema and move toward the round window. So basically the sound waves are going to come in, they're going to hit the tympanic membrane, move the ossicles, vibrate these ossicles, the ossicles are going to carry the vibration to the oval window, and the fluid in the scala vestibuli is basically going to start to shake. It's going to shake this fluid. But if the frequency is low, what's going to happen is this. This frequency is going to come in, but it's just going to go around. Here's, it's going to come all the way here to where the helicotrema is. Remember, helicotrema is where the scale of vestibula and the scale of tympani are connected. And it's going to come into the scale of tympani, come to the round window right here. And if this happens, the hearing doesn't happen. You don't hear sound waves. It's basically like it comes in and it goes around. And the reason for that is because it doesn't affect the cochlear duct. It has to basically hit the cochlear duct. The frequency has to be high enough to hit the cochlear duct for hearing to happen because the cochlear duct is going to contain the organ of corti that is necessary for hearing. Now, another thing could happen if the frequency is high. The frequency is high enough. It is transmitted through the cochlear duct into the scala tympani. So it's gonna come in here frequency is high so instead of going around to the helicotrema it's going to come and hit the cochlear duct instead and basically shake the fluid that's in the cochlear duct and in the scala tympani and at this point hearing can happen so if it hits the cochlear duct the bacillar membrane will vibrate. Remember, the cochlear duct contains this organ of corti. The organ of corti is going to contain this bacillar membrane. The bacillar membrane is going to vibrate first. 
the vibration of the bacillar membrane activates hair cells right here. These cells are going to become activated. So these hair cells are also going to start moving. They're going to start shaking or vibrating, causing action potentials to be sent to the brain. So when these hair cells start to move, the hairs on top will brush against this tectoral membrane when they vibrate, causing action potentials. And as you could see here, if you look right here, you can see that there's nerve fibers right here attached to the hair cells. When action potentials are generated, they're going to move into this, these, these uh, nerve fibers of the vestibulocochlear nerve and be carried to the brain. If we stretch out the cochlea, we could see that different parts of the cochlea, basically, different parts of the um, organ of corti, or the hair cells to be exact, respond to different frequency of waves. So high-pitched frequencies are going to be closer to the base. So this is where the oval window would be. And low pitch sounds are going to be towards the end right here. So as you age or when people start to lose their hearing, the first hair cells that are degenerated, so to speak, are the ones at the base right here because these are the ones that are the closest to the stapes. These are going to be far away. So that's why when people start to lose their hearing, it's harder for them to hear women because women have high-pitched sounds. And the reason for that is these hair cells right here respond to high-pitched sounds. So these are the first ones that you begin to lose. Okay, next we're going to talk about the vest vestibule of the ear, that's going to be this middle point. We talked about the cochlea, we talked about the organ of corti, um, and that was involved with hearing. This is the middle portion, this is called the vestibule, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, if we remove the bony labyrinth of the vestibule, you're going to see these two structures right here called the saccule and the utricle. These two structures over here to kind of look like eggs, two eggs in this area. These are actually two important structures involved with balance. Both the saccule and the utricle are going to contain something called macula, this organ, this receptor organ called the macula right here. These are sensory receptor organs that monitor the position of the head in space. In each saccule wall and in each utricle wall, there's going to be a macula. They respond to linear acceleration, but not rotation. They play a key role in posture. And this is important. The macula is the organ of static balance. Like the organ of corti, they contain hair cells. However, they, their functions are different. Um, let's look at this really quickly. So here, right here, this is the vestibule portion you're going to contain inside of it. The utricle and the saccule, two structures that look like eggs. And in the utricle and the saccule, you're going to have the macula. And the macula also contains supporting cells and hair cells, like the organ of corti. However, the function of these hair cells is different. When these hair cells move and bend, they send information to your brain regarding the position of your head in space. Again, this is the organ that's involved with static balance or acceleration. So think about it this way. If you are sitting in a car, you're in the passenger seat, your friend is driving, and you decide to close your eyes to take a nap. Now, even after you've closed your eyes, 
you still know that the car is moving forward. You would still know that the car is accelerating or slowing down, even if you can't see. And that's because of these hair cells over here, the way they bend and respond to movement. They inform your brain of your, the position of your head in space. They basically inform your brain that you're moving forward, you're decelerating or accelerating. This is just a close-up of what hair cells look like. Next you have the semicircular canals. Now the semicircular canals have a function um, similar to the vestibule but slightly different. They respond to rotational movement. So the um, vestibule had more to do with static balance with acceleration but not rotation, the semicircular canals have to do with angular movement and rotation of head and space. These organs, they have organs that detect rotational movement and these organs are called crista, cristae ampullaris. The cristae ampullaris are found in the ampulla of semicircular canals. They are excited by angular movements of the head. These are the organs of kinetic balance. And they also have hair cells and supporting cells. So we can see that these hair cells are in different parts of the labyrinth, in the cochlea, in the vestibule, in um, the ampulla. However, their functions are different. Here, here are the semicircular canals. Um, this is going to be the anterior one. This is lateral. And the one back here, this is going to be posterior. And in the ampulla of the semicircular canals, this is the enlarged area over here. This is called the ampulla. And the ampulla, you're going to have the organ called the crista ampullaris right here. We could see that there's going to be hair cells in the crista ampullaris and when the hair cells move, the hairs on the hair cells move, they basically inform your brain of the rotational movement of your head in space. And these, there's three of them in each ear, they correspond to the XYZ coordinates. Here, here you could see the crista ampullaris right here you're standing straight and then when you're rotating your head or bending your head the way that these hair cells move will inform your brain of where your head is in space so if you've been on a roller coaster um, let's say you get on a roller coaster and um, you regret your decision and it's too late so you decide to close your eyes now even though um, your eyes are closed you will have a good idea of when you're upside down, when you're turned sideways. And that's because of these crista ampullaris, because of these hair cells in your inner ear area informing your brain of where your head is in space. Okay, everyone, that is it for the ear.